I, uh, Aaron asked me to share some thoughts about national perspectives on elder abuse uh, prosecution. And my opportunities to travel around the country, speak, um, confer with, consult with different agencies has given me a, a snapshot of what is going on. And what I want to do is kind of break it into two parts, kind of share with you where we've been, what I've learned on the journey, and then also share tomorrow morning about some of the challenges that I feel we're going to be facing um, in Tennessee and across the uh, country. So thank you for that, Glenn. Okay, so there's my new title. Newly retired Deputy District Attorney. I'm still getting used to that title. Um, but I'm also showing you the two flags, and I'll tell you why. I retired in March of this year, and in early May of this year, a wonderful thing happened in my personal life. I stood in a hall in San Diego with a thousand other people, and I raised my right hand, and I became a United States citizen. I was so proud. Oh, thank you. You know, uh, I don't know whether there are any other immigrants who become citizens in the room, but if you ha have been, you know that you have to take a test to become a citizen. And if you flunk it, you can't become a citizen. You have to score six out of ten. And they give you a booklet with a hundred questions, and you don't know which ten questions they're going to ask. So you have to really revise and, and study hard for that. And I did for several weeks. I know I'm going to brag here, but I, I kind of aced the test. It was good. It was good. But the interviewer stopped me after the sixth question and said, you've been in this country 28 years. What took you so long? And I shared with her the exact reason. I said, you know what? I waited until I retired from the office of the district attorney. Because when I started out prosecuting these cases of elder abuse in January of 1996, Something happened to me. I started to realize that there was an insidious problem out there, that I was being given an amazing opportunity to, to try to do something to correct that insidious problem, and I became very passionate about pursuing predators of elder abuse. But you know what happened in my office? People in my office mistook passion for politics. And I can't tell you how many people stopped me in the corridors or in the courthouse and said, Greenwood, I've watched you over the last few months. What office are you running for? And I said, I can't even vote. Next question. And I decided that I would not give anyone the opportunity to think of my passion as being mistaken for anything else. So that's why I deferred until I retired from the office. But I tell you what, I'm so proud, so proud to have my blue American passport and uh, to be now called an American citizen. You live as I know you do, and I know that, in the finest country on earth. So, why did I retire? Why did I retire in March of this year after... Well, first of all, I had just celebrated my 25th anniversary as a prosecutor, and I like the number 25. I just thought, yeah, it sounds cool, saying you've, you've been in the office 25 years. It sounds a little better than 26 for some reason. I don't know why. I think, yeah, I think 25 is a good number to sign off on. 66. What's that got to do with it? Oh, too many of you know the answer to that. In March, I turned 66. And I was so naive and I was so caught up in my uh, job that I didn't realize that at 66, something happens to you in this country. It's called Social Security. Do you know what my favorite day of the month is now? Yeah. <laughs> Every third Wednesday. And at first, I didn't think it was going to happen. But that third Wednesday of April, I couldn't believe it. It's true! I don't know how long it's going to be true for, but it's true. It works. And I'm just so blessed. Uh, so when I added up the math, with my county in, uh, 
investment that I had done for my pension as well as Social Security. It made sense. Oh, by the way, this is not my pension. <laughs> Just in case you were thinking. This also played into my decision to retire from the office. You know why? Where did this figure come from? It came from an article that I read in the Bloomberg Press a few months ago. And this was the article. I have noticed over the last three or four years a huge escalation in the number of financial elder abuse cases. <coughs> Reports coming in from everywhere. And, and, and the types of financial exploitation are becoming more sophisticated and we are in many ways losing the battle. I questioned this number and so I, I called the journalist Nick Lieber from the Bloomberg Press and I said, Nick, are you sure you're, you're correct with this number? Because what I've read is it's $2 billion a year. He said, oh no. He said, with all my research, he said, the frightening thing is, I don't even think $37 billion is enough. It's probably higher than that. But this is one of the reasons why I decided to free myself up from my day job because of this insidious escalating problem. I wanted to share the lessons that I've learned over the last 22 years of prosecuting these cases with other folks without the day-to-day the -day, uh, responsibilities. And I was also blessed by the fact that I had been mentoring another prosecutor for the last eight years and he was ready, he was absolutely ready to take over the responsibility. There was also another number that played into this um, decision to retire from the office, 40. I just want to tell you a little bit about my journey from the UK to San Diego. Let me tell you a story. Once upon a time, there was a young man who met a young lady from Southern California. Oh, sorry. <laughs> That's the other story. Don't know how he got in there, but I guess royal prerogative. He just copied me. You see, 45 years ago, I was blessed to be traveling around the United States, and I came to San Diego for two whole days. And on the Sunday morning, I walked into a Baptist church, and I didn't know anybody in the room, and it was a young adult Sunday school program, and I walked into the room, and the only empty seat was sitting next to this beautiful young lady, and I sat down next to her, and I married her. I'm not in the same service. That was 45 years ago. It was 40 years ago, just last August, August of this year. Thank you. And I'm blessed to tell you that my beautiful wife is sitting here today with me. Darling, would you stand up, please? Thank you. Thank you so much. She's been my rock. Uh, she's been my co-pilot. Co co through all these years and uh, I wanted to spend more time with her and sh thankfully she said she wanted to spend more time with me too so <laughs> that was a deal so and that was another reason we can now travel together and, and uh, just enjoy each other's uh, company for the rest of their lives she's the love of my life so those are the reasons I retired and um, this was my office I was so proud to be part of that office and uh, it was tough to leave the office but I'm still in touch with them and, uh, and hearing all about the cases that my colleagues are prosecuting. For those of you who have not heard this very brief I want to tell you my journey began back in January of 1996. Uh, the way it happened I wasn't looking for this assignment I didn't know elder abuse existed I was called into the elected DA's office and I was told sit down Okay, Greenwood, we have a problem. Adult Protective Services have called my office. They've told me we're ignoring a huge problem, which is called elder abuse. Apparently, we are not doing a good job. So, I've decided, you're it. You're going to do it. You're going to find it. You're going to prosecute it. And that's all he said. And I said, excuse me, what is elder abuse? He said, hmm, talk to Adult Protective Services. They'll tell you. And literally, that's how it started, ladies and gentlemen. And it began 
a 22-year journey. They put me in the Family Protection Division of the District Attorney's Office where we had prosecuted child abuse, child abduction, domestic violence, and they thought it was a good fit to put me in with those prosecutors. And it turned out to be that way because there are so many common factors that challenge prosecutors in elder abuse as they do in child abuse or domestic violence. So for 22 years, that was my job, my career assignment. Very unusual for a prosecutor to be dedicated to one area of prosecution for so many years. But why did I do that? Why, why did this become my career? Two reasons. And I always refer to them, my mum and my dad. I like showing this photo to young male law students. This is how you should dress on your first date. <laughs> Boy, how times have changed. My mother is 95. My wife and I celebrated her 95th birthday in July. And sadly, my mother um, fell a few weeks ago and has just returned from hospital after six weeks in the hospital, having fractured a pelvic bone. It has brought home to me the fragility uh, when you are older, your balance, and the increased concerns when an elder falls. That's why any kind of willful pushing of an elder can be so serious. And that's why we need to pay attention to any kind of unlawful pushing, or slapping, hitting of an elder because it could end up with very serious uh, results. But my mother still lives alone. And I keep saying this to people. My mother lives alone in her house, free and clear. She doesn't drive. She depends on others for transport. She um, has to have an electrician come in, or a plumber, or a roofer to repair anything that goes wrong in the house. Do you think that my mother is the prime candidate for being the next victim of some form of uh, abuse? Absolutely. And so what we do to try to counter that is stay in touch with her. I can't tell you how many times uh, old, uh, older victims become victims because of isolation socially from their own families or from their own uh, other communities. We've got to be out on the lookout for isolation. So how we deal with it is we try to FaceTime my mother every single morning wherever possible. And, and that gives us some reassurance about my mother being not a victim of elder abuse today. My dad, bless his heart, was a victim of Alzheimer's. I'm so glad to see the Alzheimer's Association here today as one of your uh, vendors and, and one of your sponsors. Um, they do a magnificent job throughout this country. And Alzheimer's, as many of us know, is an insidious disease. And often people in the early to moderate to advanced stages of Alzheimer's become victims. We placed my dad into an Alzheimer's facility uh, six and a half years ago, and he was treated well. Although I must tell you, it did not hurt that on day one, when he was placed in the facility, I was there and I introduced myself to the administrator and said, hi, I'm Ron's son, and by the way, here's my business card. <laughs> it really helps having in large font elder abuse prosecutor from time to time. But he was well taken care of. But you know what, the, one of the reasons why I've been so inspired and passionate about protecting seniors is because my dad was a B-25 bomber pilot in World War II. And when I was seven years of age, I suddenly discovered this about my dad and I became so proud of his exploits. He never wanted to talk about it. He always downplayed his heroics, but he was a hero. He is a hero, as are so many men and women of that generation. And when I started to see people of my parents' generation becoming victims in San Diego, it lit a fire in me that has never been extinguished. So of course, when they assigned me this uh, task, they gave me all the things that the prosecutor needs, except one thing. Nobody gave me any cases. Typically in my office, detectives would come in through the door, they would hand a case. Here's a narcotics case, here's a robbery case, here's a burglary case. But nobody was coming through my door and giving me an elder abuse case. What I had to deal with was silence. And this is a big problem. 
And one of the things that this conference today is doing, and what you are going to be doing when you go back with some of the information that you've received over the next two days, you're going to be able to help break through the wall of silence that is in your community, is in your jurisdiction, that exists today. It does. And this is one of the biggest challenges that we face. Not only in Tennessee, but across this nation. How do we break through? You know, Canada said it well. They said, elder abuse thrives on silence. The time has come to bring this tragic secret out into the open. And every day that I would go to work, I would always be thinking to myself, what can I do today? What can I say today that will help at least break through this wall of silence? The Attorney General for Kansas became the president of the Attorney General's Association last year, and he made elder abuse his major platform. And this is his quote, elder abuse has been called the silent epidemic of our time. It operates too often in the shadows. And I believe that after you go back from this conference, hopefully you will be rejuvenated, you'll be encouraged, you'll be motivated to help put this crime foremost into the spotlight in your community. But how do we go, how do we do that? You know, one of the ways that we can do that is by calling for more frontline responders. One of the reasons that I took retirement was so that I didn't always have to preface my remarks with saying that this may not necessarily be consistent with the office policy. I'm now free to say whatever I like. The only person I need to be accountable is my wife. But one of the reasons I want to get to be out there is to be able to promote and speak on behalf of adult protective services. And I'm so glad that Renee is on our panel today. But we need more frontline caseworkers out there in Tennessee and across this country. Why do we need them? Because this crime is exploding. And as more and more reports come into Tennessee, across the nation, we need more frontline responders to be able to tackle this problem. And with this, I'm going to close my section for, the, for this morning and, and take up uh, the theme tomorrow. But I've said this in, in many states. You count the number of child protective service workers in your state and compare that with the number of adult protective service workers. Maybe Renee will tell us what, what she thinks the ratio is. I don't know, but in some states, it's like 10 to 1. I'm not calling for any reduction in child protective services. Absolutely not. But what I am asking the legislatives to do is understand that whilst we do not fund adult protective services properly, the predators are going to win. We've got to get more frontline people out there who can respond to all these referrals for um, help. Because, I am going to finish with one quote. This came from the Administration for Community Living, Lance Robertson's agency, that he will be here tomorrow morning. But look at what they tweeted. They said, Despite great progress, funding for elder justice is 1% for funding for child and family welfare. Something has got to change. I have some ideas how we can change it, and I'll share those ideas with you tomorrow morning. Thank you. Okay.